So I'll get as far as I can through the digestive system uh, PowerPoint today. I've already got a couple of things on the board. There is a lab list that uh, is up here. We should be able to make it through the digestive system stuff today, and we'll save urinary stuff for Tuesday. The quiz about digestive stuff is up on D2L if you wanted to tackle that. I, I believe the urinary quiz is already up there if you just wanted to take that cold uh, and get an idea of what the questions are going to be like so that whenever we come to lecture on Tuesday, you, you have an idea of what to focus on. But other than the to-do list, is everybody still doing all right? Any questions about last time? Or I guess we just had an exam last time. So the question is probably, where is your exam? And I have it almost graded. So you can take the practicals. Um, I should have those posted, like I said, by tomorrow. With that uh, to-do list out of the way, then I guess we can jump into new stuff for unit number four, which starts with the digestive system. And there's probably about 60 slides that we're going to need to make our way through. But I thought instead of jumping straight into the slides and clicking through that, that we could draw out the digestive system in kind of a linear fashion so that we at least know the order of the compartments. And, and this is kind of a theme. This is something that we're going to do with the urinary system too. When we get into the urinary system, we're going to end up looking at the functional structures of the, the kidneys called nephrons. I don't know why I'm getting into this now, but we're going to draw a nephron as this long tube. And we're going to talk about the different segments of that tube and what each segment does. I guess I'm thinking of that because we do something kind of similar today with the digestive system, where the digestive system is this nine meter long tube that passes directly through the body. And I've tried, I don't have infinite amount of space. When I started this, the screen was down in that computer, uh, whatever that cow is what they call it, I think. I don't know. That thing was in the way. So uh, the, the last bit of my diagram here got a little bit compressed, but I should be able to talk my way through that part. So this tube, like we said, is a hollow tube. Uh, it starts with the mouth. Let's just think if we swallowed a piece of gum, for example. This is some gum that has just entered the mouth. As, as it enters the mouth, the first place that you would find that piece of gum, it, or maybe I should say the first place the gum would find itself is in the oral cavity. And we're going to see this series of compartments that this gum is going to pass through as it doesn't really have any nutritious quality and is going to end up making its way directly out the other end as waste. We'll talk about kind of what happens in between. And along the way, uh, we're going to end up talking about which segments in this nine meter long tube are going to be responsible for the six functions that we have listed up for the digestive system. When we start a new unit, we usually list the functions and then we get into the anatomy, which is what we've listed here. And then we'll end up talking about eventually the physiology of what regulates the passage of food from one compartment to the next. But we'll start at the, at the very beginning. Uh, where are we at? I'm thinking of the six functions of the digestive system and I'm going to refer back to this nine meter long tube that I have drawn over there for quick reference. We're going to see the first function of the digestive system and if you have that class handout, we're somewhere right there at the very beginning, the six digestive functions. It's going to start with ingestion and we can even go through here and talk about which parts of the digestive system do that. When we're thinking of ingestion, this is going to be the mouth. This ingested food is going to find itself in the oral cavity. And there in the oral cavity, we're going to see this in some of the lab models, you have the tongue and the teeth. And what the tongue and the teeth are going to do, they're going to mechanically manipulate that food into a, a ball of food that we call a bolus. It's going to push that ball of food around in the mouth so that the teeth can mechanically break it into smaller chunks. So mechanical digestion, this is done in the oral cavity by the tongue and the teeth. The goal is to break the food down into smaller bits. Gum isn't going to get broken down into anything smaller, but if you were taking a bite of a Snickers bar, for example, you're going to break that down into small enough pieces that you can actually get it through the pharynx. That was the throat. We, in lab, broke that up into three different parts. There's the first part that we called the nasopharynx, then there's the oropharynx, and eventually the laryngopharynx. I just saved space and put the little three there that reminded us that the pharynx, the throat, is broken up into the three parts. 
The last part of the pharynx is going to lead into this esophagus. We'll see this is a long tube that connects the pharynx down to the stomach and this little sphincter that will open and close and determine if things are able to pass from the esophagus to the stomach is called the cardioesophageal sphincter. We'll see what's going on there. When we look at the digestive model, in order to see the esophagus on this digestive model, we had to remove the heart. I'm going to grab this. So the heart was sitting right there and, and, and we now can see on this torso model by removing the heart, there's the esophagus and the last bit of this esophagus, we see it goes right behind the heart and we can see it dips below the diaphragm and if we have the stomach in here, there it is. We can see where that esophagus actually enters the stomach. When we look a little closer, we're going to see that the, the epithelial tissue changes. The esophagus is going to be lined with stratified squamous epithelial cells, just like the surface of your skin. But when we get into the stomach, the cell is going to change to simple columnar shaped epithelial cells, a single layer of columnar shaped cells. That simple columnar shaped epithelial is going to stay through the stomach, through the small intestines, and through the large intestines. Um, maybe a side note. These are some of the questions that you find in the lecture handout. We need to know from the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, all of this is going to be stratified squamous. Stratified squamous epithelial tissue, but then when we get, let me grab a different color. This one will work. When we get into the stomach and the small intestines and the large intestines, we're going to see simple columnar epithelial. And then once again, when we get into the rectum, eventually all the way out. That once again goes back to this stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So the cell type changes when we get into these compartments and we're going to see that the function is going to change as well. We're going to have to add some accessory structures to this. Hello. Yeah, no problem. As always, there was technical dip difficulties that kind of slowed us down. So you're right in time. Since we're starting a new, a new system, I was listing the functions of the digestive system over here and I was trying to draw the digestive system as this nine meter long linear tube that allows us to, to put the compartments of the GI tract at least in a sequence. And what we're about to do is we're going to kind of end up talking about each compartment and what happens in each of those compartments individually. So if we are a piece of gum, that is taken into the oral cavity. We'll make our way through the opening, through the mouth, into the oral cavity. We see in the oral cavity is where the mechanical digestion occurs. The teeth and the tongue kind of manipulate that food and break it down into smaller pieces that you could swallow. So from the pharynx through the esophagus and eventually down to the stomach, this is moving food from one compartment to the next. And this movement of food through the GI tract is our third function called propulsion. I didn't list it here, but mechanical digestion, that's the teeth and the tongue that mechanically break down the food into smaller pieces. Propulsion, we're going to see, is the movement of food through this GI tract. And uh, I've broken that movement down into two different types of movement. The first type of movement is called peristalsis. And you can think of peristalsis as like a conveyor belt movement. Peristalsis is going to take food and push it constantly in one direction, just like it's a conveyor belt. From the mouth, it's going to continuously move until it makes its way all the way down to the anus. Conveyor belt motion, peristalsis. We'll see what muscles are responsible for peristalsis. And then there's another movement that we're going to see that happens along this GI tract. It really starts to happen in the stomach and in the small intestines in particular, and that's this other type of movement called segmentation. Segmentation, I'll just draw maybe as some loop-de-loops because that's my way of drawing that segmentation is more of this churning type of movement. Think of a washing machine. A washing machine, like you put the, 
detergent in there, you got your dirty clothes, and then that washing machine just kind of jostles the stuff around. It gets everything to mix together. And that's what segmentation is. It's, segmentation isn't about moving it from one compartment to the next. It's just jostling it in that compartment. And what's really, instead of mixing dirty clothes and detergent like I'm using in my analogy, what's happening in these compartments like the stomach and the small intestines where we have a lot of this churning motion, we're going to see that food is mixing with digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes, and we're going to list specific digestive enzymes that are specific to breaking down carbohydrates, specific to breaking down proteins, specific to breaking down lipids, or even nucleic acids. The, the chemical digestion, which is the next thing that we're going to, uh, these chemicals are going to break food down into their individual building blocks. We'll make a chart of what, what carbohydrates get broken all the way down into. If you remember from biology, carbohydrates get broken down in, eventually to these single unit sugars that we call monosaccharides. And when they're broken down into that small, that individual unit, monosaccharides are small enough that they could actually be absorbed across the digestive wall. We're going to see that, that that means it has to be small enough to fit through the plasma membrane of a cell and be pulled into the bloodstream. So absorption of nutrients can, can only take place after chemical digestion, after the, the food that we've eaten have, has been mechanically broken down. That allows more surface area for those chemicals to really take it and rip it down until it's, its individual building blocks. After chemical digestion, it's ready to be absorbed into the bloodstream. And we mentioned, kind of getting back to our lymphatic lecture, we talked about some things, in fact, most things are going to pick, be picked up by normal systemic blood vessels, but those lipids are going to be too large to be absorbed by blood vessels. That's where those lymphatic vessels were picking up lipids, which we had on our practical last time. This was a cross section through the small intestines, and we saw these systemic capillaries, and we even saw this yellow structure, which was our lacteal, here in the small intestines. That's where a lot of this absorption of nutrients is taking place. So let's list that. Really kind of the key thing when we get into the small intestines, what's unique to that is the absorption of nutrients. So anytime this is happening, we know we're in the small intestines. The large intestines is going to basically reclaim bile salts. We'll describe what that is. Uh, and it's going to reclaim water, things that can be reused before defecation occurs. So large intestines. And I am reminded that there are two different handouts that were available on D2L. The one is the digestive handout that has the lecture stuff that we're talking about. It starts with the six functions of the digestive system that we've listed. And then we're going to go through the separate compartments. But there is a separate handout that's called the Digestive Review Sheet. And this, the reason that I made this one is it's what I'm trying to draw on the board for you here. You have on the front page, there's a list of terms, some of which I have put in order here. And we're going to have to add to this list. There are some accessory structures that we can add on to this picture. But you've got some diagrams of these throughout this handout. I think there's three diagrams. One is of the, that pancreas model that looks just like the pancreas model that we have over here. So we've seen the spleen before. I believe we've even seen the pancreas before. And we identified this part of the small intestines as the duodenum, the first part of the small intestines, which we'll focus on more today. You've got that's the last diagram in the back. The second to last diagram is the diagram of the large intestines. I feel like we sketched that on the board at least once. So if I do that again today, you've got a diagram of that. And then there's even the diagram, this is on page three, of the small intestines. I currently have, just to save space, the letter three, the letter three, geez, that will get cut out. The number three here uh, next to small intestines to represent this diagram you see on page three, there are three different parts to the small intestines. The first part we're going to call the duodenum. Again, these terms you have uh, on that, the list on the very front of the page. I'll list these things as soon as we get into the slides as well. I just wanted to show you on this diagram, if I pin some of these things on a model, I, I w you can see that letter B here is right at the very beginning of the small intestines. It's right next to this pancreas model. 
it's obvious that that's right at the very beginning of the small intestine. So there's no hesitation in referring to that as the duodenum. We can see it's right at the very beginning of the small intestines. And then from this diagram, if you look at letter A, that's at the very last part of the small intestines. You can see that's where the small intestines makes its way into the large intestines. So B is the very beginning of the small intestines. A is the very end of the small intestines. So that puts letter C just somewhere in the middle. Uh, we're gonna see the, the, the middle part of the small intestines is the jejunum. Duodenum, jejunum, and then ileum is the last part of the small intestines. That's where we get to named this sphincter muscle, the ileocecal valve. We said this is the valve that opens and closes and lets things move from the small intestines to the large intestines. We'll see there's two sphincters at the end of the large intestines that determine whether waste is making its way out or not. Okay, so handouts. Uh, one shows the parts of the GI tract that we should be able to label all the way through, and the other one that I'm referring to has more of the functions of the GI tract and then we get into some of those accessory structures at the end. Let's put a couple of accessory structures in there now. There it is. The first one that I'm gonna put, uh, I guess I'm just gonna squeeze it in and on second thought, I'm gonna grab another color. Slightly different color. Here in the oral cavity, we're gonna see our first accessory structure called the salivary glands. I believe these have been on the lab list before. There were three different salivary glands that we had to know. All of these salivary glands released their secretions into the oral cavity. Of the three salivary glands, they are all producing what we call salivary amylase. So any of this amylase, this is an enzyme that's going to break down carbohydrates. So carbohydrate digestion happens really in the oral cavity. We'll see, and I'm jumping ahead here, that uh, that's one of the reasons why they say to chew your food a certain amount of time. So if you're eating French fries or a baked potato or something like that, that's got a lot of carbs in it. If you chew your food, if it hangs out in the oral cavity for a while, the salivary glands will secrete their salivary amylase and they'll break that down into more simplified sugars. And sometimes you get a sweeter taste in your mouth if you let the enzymes break that complex sugar down into simple sugar. If you're sometimes like me and you eat way too fast, like I ate a burger the other day where I was just taking a bite and swallowing it. So I didn't, the, the bread part of the bun, the carbohydrate part of the bun, quickly went through my oral cavity and was in the esophagus before these digestive enzymes had a chance to chemically break down the carbohydrates. We're gonna see that there are other compartments that have chemical enzymes that can break down stuff. The stomach is going to have chemical, just to jump ahead here, I know we haven't even got to the slides yet. The stomach is gonna produce an enzyme called pepsin that's gonna be good at breaking down proteins. So protein digestion, that, the chemical breakdown of proteins really starts in the stomach. And we'll see the cells that are responsible for producing that pepsin. We will need to remember that pepsin breaks down the stomach. There's another, well, there's a couple of other accessory structures we need to list and I'll put them in I guess I'm gonna to have to reuse one of these colors. As we leave the stomach and enter the small intestines, we know this is where a lot of the absorption is gonna take place. So this is where the, the final chemical digestion occurs. And we're gonna see a couple of accessory structures that are gonna be dropping their, their products directly into the small intestines, right at the very beginning of the small intestines. The first one I'm gonna list up here is the liver. Uh, I'll end up putting a box around that at some point but we're gonna see the liver is going to have secretions that it's gonna deposit right there into the small intestines. I kinda of wanna, well, let's do this now. The things that the liver is gonna be uh, producing in there is going to be 
the main thing that the liver is going to produce is bile. It's got a couple of other functions, but we're going to see one of the things that it's going to do is produce the bile. And then right next to the liver, I'll just put this box around the liver. Right next to the liver, kind of embedded into part of the liver, is the gallbladder. This gallbladder is not going to produce bile at all. Instead, what the gallbladder is going to do is it's going to store the bile that the liver produced. And also, while it's stored there, the gallbladder is going to remove water from it. So it, it further concentrates the bile that hangs out in the gallbladder. If you eat um, bile, maybe I didn't say this, bile is going to help in lipid digestion. So the bile that just comes out of your liver is good at breaking down lipids, but bile that has been in the gallbladder and become more concentrated is even better at breaking down lipids. So we have some stuff produced in the liver that's going to be good at breaking down lipids. We added the gallbladder in there because that concentrates the bile. I don't have another color, so I'm just going to go back to this orange color, and we're going to put one more structure in here next to the liver that also drops its secretions right there into the small intestines, and this is the pancreas. The pancreas is important. In fact, we're going to list two functions here of the pancreas. One of the things that we're going to see the pancreas release is that molecule. This is, this is sodium bicarbonate. And, and you know, if we just take this molecule all by itself, this is something that the pancreas produces in response to you not eating lunch. We're, we're doing this now. Let's, let's just put the two things of the pancreas. One is this sodium bicarbonate that is what the pancreas produces when you don't eat food. And then when you do eat food, the pancreas has another arm here that it can spit out all four types of digestive enzymes that can chemically break down any four of the biomolecules. If, if you kind of remember from the first of our talk here, we're going to see that a certain compartment, the oral cavity, is it's got the chemical enzymes to break down carbohydrates. The stomach has chemical enzymes to break down proteins, and the liver and gallbladder have chemical enzymes to break down lipids. Those are three of the big ones there. Um, if for some reason the liver isn't able to break down the lipids and the stomach isn't able to break down the proteins or the oral cavity isn't able to break down the carbohydrates, the pancreas kind of is a catch-all organ. It can produce digestive, I'll just say all for digestive enzymes. So if you're eating a bunch of food, even if you're swallowing your burger way too fast like I did, and the carbohydrates didn't even get a chance to be chemically broken down by the oral cavity, that's okay as long as my pancreas is working. The pancreas is going to produce enzymes that can get those carbohydrates down there. This is what's called pancreatic amylase, and it's much more concentrated than salivary amylase details that we don't have to remember. We just need to know amylase, whether it's in the oral cavity or coming from the pancreas, can break down carbohydrates. The, one of the reasons why you can't really survive without the pancreas is because we can see the pancreas is needed when you eat a big meal because it can help break down any of the food particles that you're eating to small enough pieces that they can be absorbed by the small intestines. But there are days where we don't eat. In fact, I did grab some Sonic on my way over here, to be honest. But before that, I was very hungry. And um, if you're not eating, then this stomach acid is going to drip directly into the small intestines. Again, we'll see this when we get to the slides. And I mentioned it earlier, the esophagus, this is different cells than we find in the stomach. And the, the lining of the esophagus can't handle the stomach acid like the cells of the stomach can. So if this acid gets out of the stomach and into the esophagus, it can erode the lining of the esophagus. That's where we get that heartburn feeling. Um, but just like the acid can't, it's not good for the stomach acid to make its way into the esophagus because it can damage the esophagus. It is equally unhelpful for that stomach acid to make its way into the small intestines. It can erode the lining of the small intestines as well and make it impossible for the small intestines to absorb nutrients. 
So one of the things that the pancreas does to neutralize stomach acid, if you skip lunch and all we have is stomach acid moving into the small intestines, that's when the sodium bicarbonate is released. It breaks apart into this sodium ion, which is no problem. The other part is this bicarbonate molecule that can combine with one of those random hydrogen ions uh, and, and reduce the acidity that you find damaging the lining of the small intestines. So the pancreas neutralizes stomach acid with sodium bicarbonate if we're not eating food or it can produce digestive enzymes that are like a catch-all digestive organ that can break things down chemically to small enough pieces that the small intestines, by the time we get to the end of the small intestines, absorption of that nutrients can occur. And that's the last accessory organ that we need to add I'm sure we're going to need to get to some pictures of this. Let me check my... Some of this we'll look at uh, the slides. I just want to see what I have so far. Uh, so this list that takes us all the way through the parts of the GI tract, it starts at the very beginning with the mouth. That's where we've drawn here that the gum enters the body. And then I just put pharynx here, but you have listed on this part the first part of the pharynx and then the second part of the pharynx that this gum would end up passing through before it ends up in the esophagus. Let's just do this together. Uh, the, you know, if we didn't, the gum entered our mouth. It never went through the nasal cavity, so this gum is going to enter, even though there's three parts to the pharynx, the, it's only going to end up making its way through two of these. So you've got two parts to write on this. Not that there's two parts to the pharynx, but the gum would pass through the oral cavity into that oropharynx. And then from the oropharynx, it goes through a part of that laryngopharynx. From that laryngopharynx, it is into the esophagus. And from that esophagus, it travels all the way through the esophagus and then it bumps into this cardioesophageal sphincter. I think the term you have on there is gastroesophageal sphincter. Either one works. gastroesophageal sphincter or cardioesophageal sphincter takes us from the esophagus into the stomach. Now you can see on your part there are multiple parts to the stomach. So this is where we might need to get into some of the slides to see this in more detail, but we're going to make our way all the way through this chart. I'm going to take a seat so that I'm not uh, distracting while I'm moving around there and we're just going to talk through some of these slides. It looks like the slides are a little stretched out. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I guess this is some kind of new computer software, but we won't let that slow us down. We're looking at, this is a pretty decent picture of the GI tract. I've drawn it linearly for us, but we can start here with this oral cavity. Uh, it shows us inside the oral cavity. There are the structures like the teeth and in particular the tongue. The accessory structures attached to this oral cavity we can see are the salivary glands and the three that we had on our list we even saw these on the models before the parotid gland the sublingual gland and the submandibular gland all are producing that salivary amylase from the pharynx we make our way down the esophagus eventually into the stomach we'll see in more detail the different parts of the stomach but from the stomach we're going to see that leads into this small intestines it's not immediately obvious what the where the small intestine starts and stops so the thing that you can look for is the end of the stomach that takes you right into the very beginning of the small intestines the first part of the small intestines we said is the duodenum the very last part of the small intestines right down there where the small intestines enters the large intestines that last bit of the small intestines is the ileum so anywhere in between the duodenum and the ileum that is the middle part that we're going to call the jejunum. All of the small intestines we can see have kind of uh, 
jumbled together there in the middle. They're surrounded by these larger tubes that we just refer to as the large intestines. But you can see here, we're going to separate that large intestines into four parts of a colon and then a couple of other structures like the cecum and the rectum. Uh, we even pointed to that appendix that hangs off of the cecum. You have a diagram in that uh, digestive review handout that, like we said, shows the parts of the large intestines. So let's look at some general things about that GI tract. No matter whether we're in the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, or the large intestines, we're going to see four walls, four layers along that, that digestive tract wall. One of the models that I was talking about last time, and it's this model, is showing what we're about to talk about with these slides. This model is a representation of that nine meter GI tract. And the first segment is supposed to represent those four layers that we see in the digestive wall as they appear in the esophagus. Here are the same four layers in the stomach. The third compartment are those four layers in the small intestines. And then the last part down here is the large intestines. And all four of those parts of the GI tract have in their walls, their digestive wall, these four layers. We'll start with that innermost layer. So that hollow space in the center where the gum would be traveling along, that's the lumen, that hollow space. Let's see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. There's that hollow space I'm referring to, the lumen of the GI tract. And then what we see surrounding the lumen of the GI tract, this is the innermost layer that we're calling the mucosa layer. There is this mucosa layer. If I go back to this slide, it's not labeled right here, but that is our mucosa layer. It's lined, and here's where we zoom into that mucosa layer. We're going to see it's lined by epithelial tissue. Epith epithelial tissue is always anchored to some type of connective tissue. That lamina propria is the connective tissue that that epithelial is anchored to. And then just underneath this connective tissue, we're going to see a layer of smooth muscle. It's the smooth muscle associated with this mucosa layer. So muscularis mucosa is its name. There it is. And here's when we zoom in, there's that muscularis mucosa. We can see there is the epithelial cells that line that lumen. And then you can even see those uh, kind of lighter colored cells, that lamina propria. It's got some glands embedded in it. That's the third part of that mucosa layer. So working our way out, we started from the very middle here in the lumen and we're working our way out the wall of the GI tract. We've gone through the mucus layer. Now the next layer with all of the blood vessels and glands in it, this is the submucosa layer. In fact, I can easily recognize the submucosa layer on any of these models because you can see digestive glands and what are the cross sections of blood vessels. So submucosa here, it's got a bunch of blood vessels and glands in it. And then once we get to the outside of the submucosa, we're into this outer layer that is a double layer of smooth muscle. What I like about this slide is it shows us if we look over here, the, we're kind of seeing that GI tract cut transversely. And, and we can tell there's two layers of smooth muscle, but when we look along this side of the diagram, it shows us we can kind of more easily see the, the striations, the way those smooth muscle cells are arranged. And this more superficial layer, kind of that outermost layer of muscle, you can see how those smooth muscle cells are arranged in a linear fashion. So this is what we call the longitudinal layer of muscle. It's, it's part of the external layer of smooth muscle. So the, the grouped together name is muscularis externa. We're not talking about the muscle layer of the mucosa. We're talking about the muscle layers around the perimeter. So muscularis externa is two layers of smooth muscle. There's the longitudinal muscle. That's the outermost layer where the smooth muscle cells are running the length of the tube. Whereas the circular muscles there, those are kind of running the circumference of this tube. They're the innermost layer. Maybe you could write somewhere, make a note that the circular layer of this muscularis externa is closer to the submucosa. It's deeper. Whereas that longitudinal layer of this muscularis externa is more superficial. It's further away from the submucosa and closer to this outermost layer that we just call the serosa. So there's that outermost layer. There's really just connective tissue that makes up that outermost serosa layer. 
So just underneath, and that's what we're looking at right here, this outermost layer of the, this digestive tract model. This is the outer serosa, and when we look at it even edge on, you can see this light blue serosa layer is protecting just underneath it the two layers of muscularis externa. You can even turn it on its side to see these cells. The outermost layer of smooth muscle cells are running the length of the tube longitudinally, and then the innermost layer of smooth muscles are running kind of the circumference of this tube. So we can tell the difference between longitudinal and circular muscularis. Just underneath that, we can see that submucosa layer that has the blood vessels and glands embedded in it. And then there's that innermost layer of smooth muscle that's part of that mucosal layer, the muscularis mucosa. We see those same four layers as we move from the esophagus to the stomach and then to the small intestines and eventually to the large intestines. You see some changes. There's a couple of adaptations for each of these different segments. But what is found in all of the segments are these four layers. Like we said, we'll see some of the cells lining that lumen change from a stratified squamous collection of epithelial cells through the oral cavity, through the pharynx and the esophagus. But as soon as we get into the stomach, small intestines and large intestines, those are going to turn into simple columnar cells. Okay, what... Uh, this slide is just showing us these nerve plexuses. There is a submucosal plexus. Those are the yellow nerve endings that we can see ending right there in that muscularis externa layer. Let me try that again. Myenteric plexus is the most superficial. Those are the yellow nerve endings that are going to this muscularis externa. That innermost layer that we see that's part of that muscularis mucosa layer, that's the submucosal plexus. What we need to really remember there is that these nerve plexuses are sending electrical currents to the muscularis externa layer. And this longitudinal layer of the, the muscularis is what's responsible for peristalsis that conveyor belt movement. It's like squeezing toothpaste through a tube. It, we will see that on average, it's about every two minutes that a wave of depolarization makes its way through the smooth muscles. That causes a slight contraction, and that's what keeps this, di this food moving through the GI tract from one direction to the next, that slow, consistent movement in one direction. That's what this, now we have a picture of the GI tract that's showing those six functions that we listed. There's ingestion that's done by the oral cavity. Kind of starting there in the oral cavity, we also have the mechanical digestion, the physical chewing and breaking down of that food into smaller bits. From the oral cavity, after mechanical digestion has processed this food into smaller bits, it's then swallowed moved through the esophagus and eventually lands in the stomach. That yellow line is showing propulsion. Let me qu clarify that a little bit. This uh, green line that we can see is a type of propulsion that we're calling peristalsis, this consistent movement from the mouth all the way down to the anus. But the purple lines that we see in there are the churning motion. That's the segmentation. You can see that's in places where chemical digestion is also occurring because the chemical, the chemical enzymes for digestion, that's like the laundry detergent that you put in the washer. And the dirty clothes are like the food particles that are getting broken down chemically. And that segmentation is just the movement so that those two can bump into one another. So in the stomach and in the small intestines, we can see chemical digestion occurring. And as those chemicals break the food particles down to small enough pieces, here is when we're in the, the last part of the small intestines. Chemicals have broken these pieces down, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, into their individual building blocks. And now in their small building block pieces, they're small enough that they could be absorbed by blood vessels just around the outside of the digestive system, or around the outside of the small intestines. Notice how there's three arrows that are going into the, the red, our systemic capillary. That first arrow represents carbohydrates that can be absorbed by normal blood vessels. That second arrow represents proteins that can be ab absorbed by normal blood vessels. 
and the last one represents nucleic acids. That would be like your DNA and your RNA that get chemically broken down. Those are broken up into small enough pieces that the blood vessel can absorb them. The only arrow that's not going into our normal blood vessels is this one that represents the chemical breakdown of lipids. Lipids, we're going to see, even when they're broken down into their smallest chemical piece, they're still too big to fit into our normal systemic capillaries. They have to be picked up by those lymphatic vessels that have the big uh, flaps in them, those trap doors. Okay, so we've made our way through the small intestines and we've absorbed as much of the nutrients as possible. What's left over is mostly waste, but some of that stuff, if we're not eating food, like I skip lunch all the time, and what would be making its way into the small intestines is those, I know I'm, we can't really see it because the screen is cutting it off, but the pancreas can release those, that sodium bicarbonate, that's trying to neutralize stomach acid. And that sodium bicarbonate would make its way through the small intestines as it's neutralizing that stomach acid and would eventually end up in the large intestines. And we want to reclaim that. We could reuse this sodium bicarbonate to neutralize more stomach acid. We don't want to lose that in the waste. So we'll see some of the stuff that is reclaimed here by the large intestines. It's mostly water, but other things like those bile salts and this sodium bicarbonate that can help neutralize stomach acid. Anything that's left over is just the waste or the fecal matter that's compacted and eventually defecated. I know I've crossed off this part of the diagram on our board, but we'll see the internal and external anal sphincters that are responsible for defecation. If, um, well, we'll talk about defecation reflex too at the end of this. Getting into the physiology too soon. And that's cut off just a little bit. But what I'm trying to show with this slide is that we're taking a transverse cut through the torso. So what we're seeing, we're, we're kind of, we've removed the top half of somebody's body and we're looking down into the bottom half of their torso from above. And we can see these kidneys are attached to the posterior part of this abdominal wall. And just in front of the kidneys, we can see here's a cross section through the liver and this is a cross section through the stomach. All we're pointing out here in this slide is the difference between what we're calling, in, in this term is cut off here, but there's a term called intraperitoneal versus this term over here, retroperitoneal. You may remember we were talking about serous membranes last semester. We said there are serous membranes that wrap around our delicate internal organs, like the serous membrane of the heart was the, the pericardium. There was the pleural membrane around the lungs, and around the digestive system, there's this peritoneum. There's a parietal peritoneum and a visceral peritoneum. This is that serous membrane that wraps around internal digestive organs. And we'll see how this peritoneum is basically going to surround most of the digestive tract, but not all of the digestive. Some of the parts of the GI tract get outside of this peritoneal cavity. And the parts of the GI tract that are outside of that peritoneal cavity are what we call retroperitoneal. For example, you can see the kidneys are outside of that peritoneal cavity. They are retroperitoneal. We'll see the rectum is also retroperitoneal. There's different parts of the GI tract that make their way outside of that peritoneal cavity. Here's looking at that, that abdominal cavity from the side and we can see things like the liver, we can see this compartment is the stomach. That large compartment here is the transverse colon. And what I like about this picture is that you can see all of these smaller tubes, those are all of, those are parts of the small intestines. So that light blue that you see, that wrapping around the, the tubes of the small intestines, that light blue is the visceral layer of that peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum. It's the part of that serous membrane that directly touches the, the organ that it's surrounding. Like when we said, if we were to come over here and touch the surface of the heart, this is the visceral pericardium. So if we were to somehow open up the, do like a rat dissection and, and open up the abdominal cavity and touch the small intestines, we're touching that visceral peritoneum. And the green line has shown us the parietal peritoneum that is really just lining the inside of this abdominal cavity. Between the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, there's all this space. And if you, I know I'm just using my hands, we maybe can watch a video to see this, or 
I can see if we can get our hands on some actual things to dissect. But if you've opened up the, the abdominal cavity of an organism, like a rat or a cat, you can grab the small intestines and just kind of lift them up and kind of move them around because all of the small intestines are anchored to the back of this abdominal wall by way of those purple lines that we're going to call the mesenteries. This isn't the greatest way to represent the mesenteries, but uh, one way that I can sometimes show that, I'm just going to rip a single page off of our handout, and I'm going to stick together three of these markers that I'm not using. And let's imagine that these markers are, this is the GI tract. We'll imagine that these are a hollow tubes and the lumen would be that hollow center. This piece of paper is gonna represent my visceral peritoneum. And we're gonna see that visceral peritoneum wraps around the digestive tubes and this extra little, so the, the part of this paper that's not touching the tubes, kind of this foldy part, these are the mesenteries, and the mesenteries are anchored to the back of this abdominal wall. So like I said, if we were open to open the abdominal cavity, you could grab these intestines and kind of lift them up and move them around because they're, they're attached by way of this mesentery to the back of that abdominal wall. So the part that actually touches the tube is the visceral peritoneum that's attached by way of this mesentery, and it's the mesentery that's fixed to that abdominal wall. Back to this pointer. A couple of other things that I like about this picture is it shows what we don't have a good model that shows. Most of these torso models, when I put the small intestines in here, we can see, where's the large intestines? I'm just gonna grab one that's put together back here. So you can see what I'm talking about. We can see the small intestines. There's nothing, there's, what has been removed from this model is a structure called the greater omentum. And we can see that somewhere. Is it, I seem to have, aha, geez. Okay, now we're back, I'm pointing out I was trying to point out this greater omentum, which um, there it is. Here is our greater omentum. We can see it looks like a, a curtain. It's a sheet of adipose tissue that hangs off of the stomach and it covers up this transverse colon. Like we said, we can't see it on this model. It's, there are some torso models that have re retained at least part of this greater omentum. It would be hanging off of this greater curvature of the stomach and it's a sheet of adipose tissue that covers up the small intestines. I think I have a picture of it. Here is the greater omentum has been cut. That little flap of tissue that we would see coming off of this greater curvature of the, so the outside curve of the stomach we'll call the greater curvature, and then the inside curve of the stomach we call the lesser curvature. What we can see right here is what's called the lesser omentum as opposed to the greater omentum. The lesser omentum comes off of this lesser curve, the, the inside curve of the stomach, and attaches this lesser curve of the stomach to the liver itself. There's the liver with the gallbladder embedded into it. These are all right next to the stomach. But if we look at that greater curvature, the, the outside curve of the stomach, there's also an omentum layer that hangs off of that. It's currently been cut away from this picture, but if I go to a, a couple of the next pictures, here's that greater omentum. It's that sheet of connective tissue, but what's kind of misleading about this picture is that somebody's taken that greater omentum and lifted it up. So if we go back to this picture, you can see how that greater omentum really hangs down but if we were somehow able to grab it from the bottom here and lift it up like the hood of a truck, that's what's going on in this picture. That greater momentum has been lifted up and what it has revealed is underneath there is that transverse colon and some of the small intestines. What you can also see from this picture, the small intestines 
are uh, basically anchored to the back of that abdominal wall by way of these mesenteries. This is a webbing of connective tissue that anchors the small intestines to the abdominal wall. We'll see that this webbing of connective tissue is also anchoring the different parts of the large intestines to the abdominal wall. Again, another way of just looking at this picture right here. So we saw the small intestines is anchored to the back of that abdominal wall by way of the mesenteries. And we're gonna see things like this transverse colon. It's also anchored to the back part of that abdominal wall by way of the transverse mesocolon. These are not gonna be a bunch of questions on the exam, but this one slide does help answer some of the matching questions in the lecture handout when it wants you to know, you know what part of the GI tract anchor, how can I say that again? Uh, there's some questions in there that want you to know how the different parts of the GI tract are anchored to the abdominal wall. So there are different structures we can see that anchor different parts of that GI tract to the abdominal wall. We'll go through all of those uh, whenever we compare our lecture handouts. Uh, so back to this picture here. I keep, in effect, I think it's on the very next picture. I want to show this greater omentum as it's hanging down like it normally is. This over here is where that greater omentum is, is hanging down and it's covering up all of the small intestines so that we, we can't really see them from this picture. The picture on the left is like I, like I said the, the picture before was where that greater omentum has been lifted up like the hood of a car so that you can see what was underneath that greater omentum. It was protecting all of those small intestines. So there's the greater momentum hanging down as a curtain of adipose tissue. And here's a picture of that torso model that I said some torso models will actually still keep that greater momentum on half of the small intestines. But I guess why they remove it on a lot of them is so that you can tell the difference between the, the different parts of the small intestines. There is our duodenum, the, the part of the small intestines that the pancreas attaches to. There's our pancreas. Then we can see down here at the very end, if you look closely on that model, there's a part of that small intestines that opens up. So, and it reveals where the small intestines enters this part, the large intestines. So that last part of the small intestines we know is the ileum and anywhere in between, we can just call the jejunum. Also stuff that we had seen in our previous lecture, but we talked about how that celiac trunk comes off of this abdominal aorta and it sends blood over to the stomach. That's our left gastric artery. There's that blood vessel that sends blood over to the spleen, our splenic artery, and then the other branch making its way over to the liver was our common hepatic artery. Uh, what we talk about in this lecture though is really what the liver is doing, what the gallbladder is doing, and what that pancreas is doing back there. What do I want to say about this? This is noteworthy, I guess, because it's the second and only other time that we'll see a portal vein in our anatomy. The first portal vein was connecting those two capillary beds. One capillary bed was in the hypothalamus. The other capillary bed was in the anterior pituitary gland. And we said a portal vein is just a vein that connects two capillary beds. So this portal vein is going from the small intestines to the liver. It's our hepatic portal vein. I think it made the lab list last time that we had a lab practical. But we can see blood that is, and, and that kind of makes sense. If things are being picked up here in the small intestines, that, that stuff that's being pulled into the bloodstream into the small intestines, it might have bacteria on it. In fact, there's a lot of those things that get recalled, like tomatoes or lettuce, or there's always some, something that's getting recalled. Because when you ingest it, it's making people sick. It's getting them there's some type of bacteria on the substances that they eat that is getting into the bloodstream. So one way to help prevent pathogens from getting all around the body once they get into the bloodstream is we're going to see that blood that's, let me say that again. In the small intestines, we've got nutrients that are coming into the bloodstream and we want to make sure that that nutrient is cleansed of any pathogens. So all of this nutrient rich blood goes first through the liver. And one of the jobs of the liver, I even pulled this out last time, there is a liver model somewhere. Here it is, right in front of me. And this liver, we'll even draw this today. There's this, the zoomed in 
picture here of a liver lobule. And if we look inside those little channels of the liver lobule, those are what we'll call sinusoidal capillaries of the liver. You can see those little pink looking star structures. You can barely see those things in there. Those are gonna be monocytes. Those are immune cells that are basically trying to clear this nutrient rich fluid of any pathogens that might be on it. So we've got part of the immune cells there in the liver and they're trying to prevent any bacteria from making their way all throughout the rest of the body. So that's our hepatic portal vein connecting the small intestines to the liver. Just to make sure, yep, it looks like the next few slides are what take us right to the beginning of our oral cavity and we're going to look at our detailed series of slides going all the way through this GI tract. And it starts here in the oral cavity. We can see better than I've drawn on the board. There are uh, the teeth and the tongue that are going to help manipulate this food and do that mechanical digestion. Also on the lab list, if you have the lab list handy, when we look at those half head models, kind of the, this big half head model that we've had over here, if you look at the roof of the mouth, like we can use this slide up here, the lab list wants us to know the difference between the hard palate, where there's an actual palatine bone, and then the soft palate back here, which is just muscle and connective tissue. This flap of muscle and connective tissue that we call the soft palate, at the very end of it, there's that part that dangles in the back of the oral cavity when somebody says, ah, and you're looking in the back of their mouth, you're seeing this structure that dangles called the uvula. When you swallow, we're gonna see that this uvula closes off the entrance to the nasal cavity. But sometimes like if you're drinking something and somebody makes you laugh, that fluid can end up in the nasal cavity and you don't intend it to. What usually prevents it from ending up in the nasal cavity is this uvula that closes off. It kind of performs a similar function to this structure that we saw on the larynx model. We called this structure on the larynx the epiglottis. And that epiglottis is going to also close when we swallow food. It, it closes off the entrance to the trachea. Here's that uvula that's dangling into the back of the oral cavity when somebody says, ah. We can even see those palatine tonsils, which are kind of flanking either side of that oral cavity. This is showing us, I think that the lab list may have what's also called the lingual frenulum. This lingual frenulum is that little patch of connective tissue that you would see anchoring the tongue to the bottom of the oral cavity, that little stretch of connective tissue. There's also uh, what are called these labial frenulums. These are the, the same frenulum you would find on the upper lip or the lower lip. Little straps of connective tissue. What else? The lecture handout wants us to know the difference between these deciduous teeth. These are the ones that you lose, your milk teeth or deciduous teeth, versus your permanent teeth. In, in terms of permanent teeth, we can see four different types of teeth. There are these incisors, which we can see right up front. The incisors are flanked on either side by the canines. And then just past the canines, we have the molars. Sorry. Just past the canines, we have the premolars and then eventually the molars. But if we go over here to the deciduous teeth, the only ones that are not present are the premolars. So you've got incisors, you've got canines, and you've got molars. But those are all going to be lost and replaced by permanent teeth. And in permanent teeth, we get the addition of these premolars. So incisors, canines, premolars, and then our molar teeth. They have no premolars. So here is that oral cavity. We can see the teeth and tongue that do that mechanical digestion. But here we're reminded of those salivary glands, which I believe we've introduced before, the parotid gland, that submandibular gland, and sublingual gland. We'll see them on the same model again. But we need to remember, at least this time, we need to know that they produce a salivary amylase that is good at breaking down carbohydrates and carbohydrates only. Cannot break down proteins, lipids, or nucleic acids. 
Here's that picture that shows the process of food leaving the oral cavity and making its way down the esophagus. The first step in swallowing is that the tongue is going to manipulate that bolus of food into the back of the oral cavity. You can see when that bolus of food enters the back of the oral cavity, those two things happen that I mentioned. The uvula closes off the entrance to the nasal cavity and the epiglottis closes off the entrance to the larynx. So that food only has one way to go now. It can't get into the nasal cavity and it can't go down into the trachea. The only place it can go now is into the esophagus. So the third phase is our esophageal phase where that food moves by way of peristalsis down the, eso down the esophagus and eventually into the stomach. What has to open for it to make its way into the stomach is that cardioesophageal sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter. So here's that esophagus and I'd mentioned that, that the lining of the oral cavity, the lining of the pharynx, and the lining of the esophagus is all stratified squamous epithelial tissue, but that's going to change when we make our way into the stomach. And if you look over here on the far right hand side of this slide, right there is where the esophagus stops and the stomach begins. You can see the cells change. Everything before this is all stratified squamous epithelial tissue. It's non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. We can still see the nuclei in there. But right after this line, we go immediately into simple squamous epithelial tissue. So we've entered the stomach. The epithelial tissue changes and the functions are going to change now. We're going to see some cells in the walls of the stomach that are going to start to produce that pepsin that's good at breaking down proteins. So let's think about the stomach for a second. If you have that, that review sheet that we said that looks at all parts of the GI tract, here's where we leave the esophagus and we enter the stomach. And I'm going to grab mine just so that I know we're all on the same page. You can see just past the esophagus there is that cardioesophageal sphincter and it's even labeled at least right out to the right hand side of the blank the sphincter or valve you can put cardioesophageal sphincter but just after that cardioesophageal sphincter what that that tells us we're no longer in the esophagus we've now moved into the stomach and the first part of that stomach we can see right here is called the cardia it's called that because the the apex of the heart is adjacent to this area so there's the cardia, and then as we make our way further into the stomach, we can see there's kind of this expanded, this dome roof on the stomach. That dome roof is the fundus. So as we make our way through the cardia, kind of the entrance way, and then around this domed roof, which we call the fundus, we're now into the main chamber of the stomach that we just call the body of the stomach. Something unique about the stomach, it's the only part of this GI tract that has three layers of smooth muscle in that muscularis externa. Uh, and that's why I had this stomach out somewhere. It's not great, but this, this little scratchy stuff that we can see on the side of the stomach, this is showing us the three different layers of muscle. There's the longitudinal muscularis, which is the most external layer there's the circular muscularis, which is just underneath that. And then there is an oblique layer of muscle. That's the innermost layer. We can see that on the outside of the surface of the stomach on this particular stomach model. I think that's also a question somewhere in our lecture handout. But going through the parts of the stomach, we've got the cardia as the first part. The second part is the fundus. And then the third and largest part of the stomach is the body of the stomach. After the third and largest part of the stomach, we enter what we call the distal region of the stomach, and the distal region of the stomach is what we call the pylorus or pyloric region. You can call it the pyloric region or pyloric canal is kind of to the end of that pyloric region. So the pyloric region is the distal region, and it comes to an end by running into another one of those sphincter valves. This one is called our pyloric sphincter, or sometimes just called the pylorus. That's our little passageway that if we can cross through the pylorus, we are no longer in the stomach and we're now in the small intestines. 
So we know the parts of the small intestines, there are three. The first part is this duodenum. Well, still on the stomach, and we can see the stomach leads into the duodenum. I think before we get into the small intestines, which is where I'm going, let's look at this slide, which is still in the stomach. And maybe I can do this just by pointing. But we said in the walls of the stomach, there are those three layers of muscle. There's the longitudinal muscularis, the circular muscularis, and then in addition to that, there's this oblique layer. So that's one thing that's unique. The other thing that we need to point out that is obvious, if I hold this model up right here, the second layer is what represents the stomach. And you can see if you look in that layer that represents the stomach, there are those little holes. We can see them on the slide as these little pits that you would, if you were walking along the lumen of the stomach, like if we were in one of those Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movies, and we shrunk ourselves down, and we're walking along the lumen of the stomach, we might accidentally fall down into one of these holes. Those holes we're going to see are called gastric pits. Here's one labeled right there. There's one of these holes. This gastric pit, if we were to fall into it, at the base of that pit, look at how the cells change color. What we run into at the base of this gastric pit is called a gastric gland. And the gland is where the cell, the cell type changes. They're showing that here with different colors. But that light blue color, those, are, those cells are called parietal cells. Maybe let's, let's label it this way. Uh, in the stomach, we need to know how this pepsin is produced. And it's going to be by a combination of these parietal cells. Parietal cells are going to pump out hydrochloric acid. And the other type of cell that we see here, they're showing those in this purple color. Those purple cells at the very base, those are the chief cells, and they make pepsinogen. Can I see that? Pepsinogen. Anytime we see that O G E N ending, it tells us that this is inactive. But what happens when we combine hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, these together, this hydrochloric acid basically cuts off part of this pepsinogen protein and converts it into its active form, pepsin. And this thing can now go to break down proteins. So there are cells in the walls of the stomach primarily the chief cells and the parietal cells that produce a product that when combined is converted into pepsin. And that pepsin is going to start to break down proteins if they're available. So what I just drew there for us on the board, uh, those chief cells down there, these are the lighter tan colored cells in this diagram. Chief cells are pumping out this pepsinogen it looks like part of my diagram is getting cut off at the top, but chief cells pump out pepsinogen. Those parietal cells, the darker brown cells, are pumping out hydrochloric acid. Together, that hydrochloric acid, like we said, cleaves off part of pepsinogen and converts it into its active pepsin form, and it goes to work breaking down proteins, chemically chopping them up into their tinier fragments. Okay, so I did have that up there. Moving past the stomach, and then uh, you can see our next place that we're about to go is into the small intestines. And there's the first part of the small intestines. But it looks like these slides are going to want us to be aware that uh, there are going to be several accessory glands that enter and, and deposit their products into the small intestines, right at the very beginning of the small intestines here in this duodenum. We mentioned it up there on the board. There's the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas that all drop their secretions right there into that duodenum. We said the pancreas has the dual function of having to make all four types of digestive enzymes, amylases that break down carbohydrates, proteases that break down proteins, uh, lipases like the, the enzymes that break down lipids, 
and then the nucleases that break down DNA and RNA. So they're all, they're capable, they're like a catch-all digestive organ. It can break down any of the, the molecules that you give it. But if you're not eating food and all that's coming out of the stomach is digestive acids, then we need to be able to neutralize that acid. So some of the cells of the pancreas don't produce digestive enzymes at all. Instead, they produce that sodium bicarbonate whose job is, it is to neutralize that stomach acid if you skip a meal. If we look closer, so right now we can just see the pancreas. There's the tapered end of the pancreas that we call the tail of the pancreas. There's the big, the main part of the pancreas that we call the body of the pancreas. But then this broad part that is attached to the duodenum, that's the head of the pancreas. So head, body, and then tail of the pancreas. If we look more closely into the pancreas, here are those pancreatic ducts that make their way all the way through the pancreas. You can see attached to this pancreatic duct, there are these exocrine groups of cells. The green cells that we call the duct cells, those are the ones that produce hydrochloric acid. Let me say that one more time. I said hydrochloric acid and I meant to say sodium bicarbonate. Those are two different things. Sodium bicarbonate, there it is right there on the screen. Sodium bicarbonate is that molecule that neutralizes stomach acid and the duct cells of the pancreas are responsible for, for producing that sodium bicarbonate. Down here at the base of those ducts, these are going to be what we call the ASNR cells. Those ASNR cells are the ones that are pumping out all of these different digestive enzymes. We don't have to remember each specific digestive enzyme, but I'll, I'll put a simplified chart on the board that just reminds us of the four major biomolecules and the four enzymes that break them down and also what they're broken down into. It's the end of this PowerPoint that we're about to get to. But just a cross section through the pancreas, there are the, the, this main pancreatic duct that if we go along that pancreatic duct, we can see these collection of cells that are either duct cells that make this sodium bicarbonate, neutralizing stomach acid, or the ASNR cells that, break, that make up digestive enzymes to break down food if you happen to be eating food. So the pancreas can deal with whether you're eating stuff or whether you're not eating stuff. It's something that you have to have. Um, anyway, so that's why pancreatic cancer is one of the worst types of cancer to have because it's hard to survive not having a pancreas. Here is what I was just trying to say in a more simplified picture, hopefully. This left-hand picture here is just thinking about these pancreatic duct cells, just the green ones. And we said if there is acid that is entering that duodenum, that's the way, that's how the small intestines is able to tell, wait a minute, this person must not have eaten lunch because all we have coming from the stomach is acid. So what happens is the signal is sent to these pancreatic duct cells to release their sodium bicarbonate and that sodium bicarbonate neutralizes that stomach acid. In the other scenario over here, what we have coming into the small intestines by way of the stomach is fats and proteins. This would be the case if you've just eaten some big meal. Now the signal is being sent not to the duct cells to neutralize stomach acid, but instead to those ASNR cells to tell them start pumping out those digestive enzymes. We could, it could be somebody like me that's scarfing down a hamburger and doesn't chew up their food and so we might need some of this pancreatic amylase ready to break down those carbohydrates. Okay, so we talked about the pancreas breaking stuff down or neutralizing stomach acid right there at the beginning part of the small intestines. When we look at some of the adaptations of the rest of the small intestines, we have on the board, we know that the small intestines is all about absorption of nutrients. And one adaptation we see that helps in the absorption of that nutrients are these large, um, how can I, th there are these folds, they're called circular folds or they're also referred to uh, as these giant villi that stick out and they drastically increase the surface area in the small intestines. That's what you would want, you would want as much surface area as possible to maximize absorption of the nutrients. And 
The circular folds are one way that surface area increases, and if we can look at one of those circular folds, we can see that they're studded by those finger-like projections that we called villi. Those, again, that's another way in which surface area is increased. Even if we were to, to zoom in on one of those little finger-like projections, that is one finger-like projection, one of those villi. We see each villi is lined by simple columnar epithelial cells, and if we look at those simple columnar epithelial cells, we can see that on their apical surface, they have microvilli. That's just a folding of the plasma membrane that increases surface area. The folding of the microvilli, that's also referred to as what, what we call the brush border. This, that's another way of just saying microvilli in the small intestines. Absorption of nutrients takes place across this brush border. Those are the the epithelial cells in, in which carbohydrates, lipids, and, and proteins are gonna be pulled across that plasma membrane and into these cells. We're gonna see that, that whether it's carbohydrates, proteins, or nucleic acids, that substance, once it enters the cell, is gonna make its way through these cells and then be picked up by one of these capillaries. Look at what's on the other side of the cells. We've got our systemic capillaries waiting to pick up, like we said, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and proteins, and we've got our lipid. Let me say that again. We've got our lymphatic vessel ready to pick up lipids. So right here in the small intestines, we've got all of the capillaries and even that lacteal that's ready to absorb any of those four ba uh, major biomolecules. Again, one villi that's coated with the simple columnar epithelial cells. We can see that each columnar shaped cell has microvilli. Okay, so that's fine. This is just a slide of the small intestines. We can once again see these large villi. We can see that layer of columnar-shaped cells that line the small intestines. So as we leave the small intestines, in fact, let me just make sure that's where we're at. As we leave the small intestines and enter the last bit, which, what we're calling the large intestines, we said the function here was compaction of waste and to reclaim any water or things like sodium bicarbonate that can be reused. Here's the picture of the, the large intestines, which is made of four parts of a colon and then some additional parts. And in fact, that little bit that we are looking at, that's the last bit of the small intestines. That's our ileum. So to leave this ileum and enter the large intestines, we would have to make our way across this ileocecal valve. So let's, let's imagine we cross through that ileocecal valve then we have entered the large intestines, but if we turn around and go down this way, this is the little blind sac. It's an ending part of the, the large intestines that we call the cecum. And attached to that cecum, there's this extended little tube that we called the appendix. When we looked at this, I think this was in our lymphatic system, we saw that the appendix housed a bunch of the lymphoid tissue. So there was lots of T cells and B cells that were hanging out in the, the, this cecum and in the appendix. Their job was really to keep the gut bacteria populations relatively low, close to that ileocecal valve. We didn't want the bacteria getting back into the small intestines where they could be pulled into the bloodstream. If they did get into the small intestines, we saw right there at the distal end of the small intestines, that's the only place we found those pyres patches that densely packed malt that we found, again, as a prevention from trying to prevent gut bacteria from being absorbed into the bloodstream of the small intestines. So leaving the small intestines, entering the large intestines, we've got the cecum, we've got the appendix, but now if we go the other way, we make our way up this part of the colon that we call the ascending colon. As we make our way up the ascending colon, we can move across this transverse colon and then eventually down the descending colon, and then there's this little S-shaped sigmoid colon. After the S-shaped sigmoid colon, we just have the rectum and the anus. Now there's a couple of other things to point out. I think on your review sheet, there were these 90 degree angles, these little fixtures that, that we see where the large intestines makes this 90 degree turn here. What's not shown up here is there would be the liver. The liver would sit right over here above this part of the large intestines. So this 90 degree angle is, is called the hepatic fixture. Hepatic is a term that just refers to liver. So this is the, the side of the large intestines that would bump right up against the liver. 
But on the other side, on this, once we go across this transverse colon and where the transverse colon and the descending colon meet, this 90 degree angle is called the splenic fixture because the spleen would be right there. Just trying to go back a couple of pictures to see if we had one of those, but we'll just have to see this on the model. Hepatic fixture is between ascending colon and transverse colon. Splenic fixture is between the transverse colon and the descending colon. A couple of the other things that we need to see on there, since I have this in front of me, there are the, that line of connective tissue that we call the tinea cola. In fact, that's not on your diagram, but I feel like it's on the lab list. This strip of connective tissue. There it is, our tinea cola. And then we can see that there are these little pouches each of those little pouches that we find along this large intestines is called a hostrum. I guess those are just on the lab list and not on this diagram. But splenic fixture and hepatic fixture are, so we've pointed those out. Here's a close-up of that ileum where it leads here into the large intestines. We can see that cecum and that would be the opening that leads into the appendix. Here are cells of the small, uh, sorry, a cross section through the large intestines and we can still see a simple layer of columnar shaped epithelial cells. So we know we're not in the rectum yet. But uh, now that we've at least introduced the six major functions, we've got just a couple of slides left that take us into those accessory structures. We've already seen this one. We talked about the pancreas having the dual function of either breaking down the food that you eat or neutralizing stomach acid in the event that you forgot to eat any food. So that's the pancreas. Let's think about the gallbladder for a second. This gallbladder, we said, doesn't produce anything at all. Instead, it just stores the bile that the liver produces. I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is a question on here or not, but, and I wish the screen was a little bit sharper but you have, we can just barely make out these little green vessels here. This one would be coming from the right side of the liver and the other one that's kind of faint would be coming from the left side of the liver, but the left and the right side of the liver, they're, they're both producing a bunch of bile. And that bile is gonna make its way through these right and left hepatic ducts and eventually down through what we call the cystic duct. The cystic duct leads into the gallbladder. So all that bile that's produced you can think of the cystic duct as a two-way street. So it lets bile enter the gallbladder. And then after you eat a big fatty meal, then you need this concentrated bile. Uh, and that's through these gallbladder contractions. This concentrated bile can actually make its way out that cystic duct and down what we call the bile duct. The bile duct just leads through the pancreas and into this duodenum. It's how secretions from the liver and the gallbladder get into the duodenum. One of the things that that bile is good for, like we said, was breaking down of lipids. But I wanted to list more things on the board that the liver is doing. In fact, there's about 200 different functions that we could list for the liver, but I'm going to boil it down to just three key functions. The first we have up there, which is production of the bile. That helps us break down lipids. The second key function of the liver is something I think we mentioned before, which is production of those plasma proteins. Albumin was the most common plasma protein and it was responsible for maintaining that blood osmotic pressure. So the liver produces plasma proteins. The third thing that the liver is gonna do is it's gonna store excess nutrients when needed. It's true that after we eat a big meal, our liver actually swells up a little bit because it's storing that excess nutrients. And if we were to be on like one of those survival shows where we go weeks without eating anything, your liver would shrink as it's releasing those stored nutrients. I mean, our liver swells and shrinks, but not to the extreme of something like one of those giant anaconda snakes. Those things can go like six months to a year without eating anything. And then when it eats a big meal, that liver will swell up like two to three times its normal size. And that's where it stores all that excess nutrients. And then as that snake goes for months without eating, it doesn't starve because the liver is slowly shrinking and releasing those nutrients that it stored. 
So storage of nutrients, production of plasma proteins, and then production of the bile are three things that we can list as liver functions. And if we start to take a cross section through the liver, we can see the cells actually responsible for those functions. Instead of drawing this, you'll have to recognize a diagram of a liver lobule. Here we are making our way to this diagram, I'm sorry. Here we are making our way to this model that I kept talking about. There is one part of this model. I'll just make my way up here. There's one part of this model that is more zoomed out. It represents this side of the model that shows multiple liver lobules. Each liver lobule you can see has a, a center hollow space that we're going to call the central vein. Here we've zoomed into just one of those liver lobules and we can kind of see it makes this little hexagon shape. That's what we have on the right hand side of this model. We've zoomed in to one of these liver lobules and the model is trying to show us here at the very center is the central vein and then around the perimeter we're going to see these there's actually three blood vessels that we're going to see around the perimeter here uh, now that we've zoomed in on it that diagram on the board is the same thing as this liver model that I'm holding in my hand so in lab we should get a little closer picture of what this liver lobule looks like at the center there is this central vein that's it's basically like a vacuum kind of pulling things in from the corners of these liver lobules. So if we look at any of these liver lobule corners, there's a corner, there's a corner, there's another corner. Each of these corners, they have three vessels. Notice how those, there's a red vessel, there's a blue vessel, and a green vessel. The red vessel is what we call our hepatic artery. The green vessel is what we call the bile duct and the blue vessel is the hepatic portal vein. Together, the portal vein, that hepatic artery that they're calling the portal arteriole here, and that bile duct, all together, those make up what we call a portal triad, three vessels. And you see those same three vessels at each corner of this liver lobule. That's one. The second thing that I want us to see is that and the arrows are not everywhere on here, but if we can look right there, that artery, that hepatic artery and this portal vein, the fluid leaving those vessels, you can see the, the white arrows, that fluid is leaving the artery and leaving this portal vein and making its way towards the central vein. Those little vessels that it's traveling through, those are the liver capillaries. We call those special type of liver capillaries, those are the liver sinusoids. You remember sinusoidal capillaries? Those were the ones that had gigantic holes in their walls. We found them in the liver, and what those big holes allowed is for large things like plasma proteins to enter the bloodstream. The liver makes those plasma proteins, and thankfully those large holes in the sinusoidal walls allow plasma proteins to get into circulation. So through the, this blue liver capillary is our liver sinusoid, it just takes this nutrient-rich fluid. So again, the blue vessel, that's a hepatic portal vein. That's carrying nutrient-rich, oxygen-poor blood. So it's just come from the small intestines. It's, it's full of nutrients. It's just oxygen-poor, so we're drawing it in a blue color. The hepatic artery, that's delivering oxygen-rich blood. So now these cells of the liver, in fact, all of those little tan-colored cells that you see, those are the liver hepatocytes. They exist in rows of cells, so they're sometimes called uh, plates of hepatocytes just because they're in these continuous rows of cells. But those hepatocytes, those cells are the ones that are carrying out the three functions of the liver that we listed. Those hepatocytes are producing bile. Those hepatocytes are storing nutrients, and those hepatocytes are producing plasma proteins. We said, if this is nutrient-rich fluid that's coming in from the portal vein, those hepatocytes can store that excess nutrients and release it back into circulation whenever we're not eating a bunch of food. Those hepatocytes produce plasma proteins, like we said. But let's look right here. The green, the tiny, thin green vessels that are smaller than the bile duct, those are called bile canaliculi. And like if we just look down here, you can see those, the cross section through all those bile canaliculi. Those green tubes, they're running in between the hepatocytes. 
And we know that those hepatocytes, out of, basically out of the front door, they're storing nutrients and producing plasma proteins, but out of their back door, they're producing bile. So each of these hepatocytes, I know it's not a, super obvious from this picture here, but you can see out of the, the opposite side of those hepatocytes, there is a little green bile canaliculi that's capturing that bile those cells produce and delivering that bile to this bile duct. I don't really see the arrows on there, but, but what I'm just trying to show is that, that we've got We've got traffic that's running opposite directions. Through this liver sinusoid, we've got things running from the, the portal triads out here to the central vein. Things are moving towards the central vein. But in the bile canaliculi, the bile is going the opposite direction. The bile is going from these hepatocytes out to the bile duct. Okay, maybe too much on the liver lobule there. Uh, what are, I just want to show these hepatocytes, those are the liver cells that do those three functions, make plasma proteins, store nutrients, and produce bile. Okay, so we'll move away from that, and uh, that actually takes us into the, the last few slides that I don't have to draw much, but it just reminds us of the chemical breakdown of the four major biomolecules. I'll put this up. This will be the last thing that I put up. but it might be worth listing if we haven't been in a cell and molecular biology class recently. Let's list those uh, biomolecules. So uh, we'll start here with the substrate. This is the substance that we're gonna break down our options are either carbohydrates, so that's going to be our sugars. Uh, there could be proteins. We could have lipids or nucleic acids. This is just our DNA and our RNA. fats. Uh, obviously carbohydrates and proteins uh, are in there. The enzyme of digestion that's going to break each of these four biomolecules down That's our biomolecule, the substrates. For carbohydrates, we said it's amylase. This amylase is gonna break carbohydrates down and, and what it's gonna break them down into, their individual building blocks. Um, I'm gonna use this term monomer just to describe the individual unit that a carbohydrate is broken down into. This amylase is going to break a carbohydrate down into its individual building block that we're going to call a monosaccharide. Barely fit it in there. Monosaccharide, that's just a simple sugar. An example would be something like glucose or galactose or fructose. So those are all monosaccharides. Those are small enough to be pulled into the bloodstream. So absorption could take place of carbohydrates once they're chemically broken down into monosaccharides. Proteins are long chains of amino acids. They're way too big for uh, absorption to take place, so they have to be chemically broken down. Proteins, we're going to see that it's pepsin. is one of the main protein enzymes. So this is an, uh, a protein enzyme. We see it's produced in the stomach and it's gonna break proteins down into their individual building blocks that we call amino acids. So proteins are broken down into individual amino acids. Fats or lipids are gonna be broken down by 
Well, there's bile we're going to see is going to help in this process. Bile is, is part of it. The other part are going to be these lipases. So bile and lipases are going to be the enzymes that break lipids down. Lipids are going to get broken down into fatty acids. Which we're going to see are still pretty big. So those lacteals, those lymphatic vessels, are going to have to pick up uh, the lipid parts. And then nucleic acids like our DNA and RNA, there are going to be nucleases. That ASE tells us it's an enzyme. So these nucleases are the ones that break it, uh, DNA and RNA down into their individual building blocks, these nucleotides. That last one, DNA and RNA, is not typically broken down as a fuel source. That's an information storage molecule. Whereas carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, among other functions, each of these do function as a energy storage molecule. So we see more enzymes that break those down. Back to the slides. This first uh, slide is showing us carbohydrate digestion. So this is a disaccharide. It's not a simple sugar. It's, it's two simple sugars linked together. And if we could break that link to produce these two individual monosaccharides, well now absorption can take place. We've got two monosaccharides. Uh, Again, the top part of the slide is cut out just a little bit. But what I like about this slide, this is kind of a, this is kind of a summary slide because it's, it's kind of like the chart I put on the board. It shows us the four major biomolecules, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and nucleic acids. It shows us what their complex form looked like. These complex sugars are chains of glucose, chains of monosaccharides. And by way of these amylases, they can break these complex sugars down into individual monosaccharides. So they're showing the breakdown of carbohydrates from complex to simple sugars. They just don't have on this slide that it's amylase that accomplishes that. So I wish that was there. I like this picture because it shows lipids. Are, they start out as these large triglyceride molecules. This shows us three fatty acid tails anchored to this glycerol backbone. And when lipids are chemically broken down by bile and lipases, they're broken down into these fatty acid tails, which are still pretty large. And we're going to see, have a special way of crossing the, the cell membrane, I guess, to get absorbed. I'll explain lipid absorption in just a second. Uh, we've got proteins, which you can see here. This is a, trying to represent a chain of amino acids. And just one of those individual links in the chain, this, picture is one of those amino acids. And it would be pepsin that would break the protein down into its individual building blocks, these individual amino acids. So lipids are broken down by the lipase and the bile. Proteins are broken down by pepsin. Then we've got nucleases that break down the DNA and the RNA to the individual nucleotides. So just back to this picture that is show that what this is trying to represent that little wavy line that is the microvilli that we would find on the apical surface of those small intestines cells so this this space up here represents the lumen of the small intestines and we can see there's a protein that's making its way through the lumen and the job of some of these proteases that break down the proteins is, is to take this long chain of amino acids and start to break it down into its individual building blocks, those individual amino acids. Now in this individual amino acid form, it's small enough that it could be pulled across this plasma membrane and absorbed by these cells. Remember, once they're pulled into these cells, they, they cross the cell and enter the bloodstream. They make their way into the capillary. So proteins can make their way into the capillary. The top part of this is cut off, so I'll just have to describe what we're missing up here. This, what we should have seen up here, is a long chain of amino acids. This is a long protein, and all that we would see on the top part of this picture is that pepsin is this enzyme that takes large proteins and breaks them down into smaller proteins. These small peptides or individual amino acids. Individual amino acids can be absorbed. 
If they're small peptides, they have to further be broken down into those individual amino acids. So maybe the thing to remember here is that proteins are chemically broken down by pepsin into their individual pieces that we called amino acids. Here's the, another one of these pictures that shows protein absorption. There's the brush border. Those are the cells that line the small intestines. And not that we have to know each protein that's labeled there, but the theme of what's going on, we can see amino acids being pulled across these cells, so into the cytoplasm of a cell, and then it leaves the basal surface of this cell to jump into a bloodstream. So maybe the take home here is that amino acids are making their way into these systemic, our normal capillaries. Here is the picture of carbohydrates. And this, this one is not cut off at least. We can see our complex carbohydrate, our long chain of, of glucose molecules. They can be broken down by either salivary amylase or pancreatic amylase. Either way, we said it was this amylase that breaks down complex sugars into these smaller monosaccharides. Eventually monosaccharides, those are small enough to be pulled into the blood vessels. So once again, it's a systemic blood vessel that carbohydrates are making their way into. So far, proteins have made their way into normal systemic capillaries. Carbohydrates have made their way into normal systemic capillaries. And I'll just give away that nucleic acids are also going to be pulled into these normal systemic capillaries. The only ones that aren't are these large triglycerides. This is a triglyceride. We can see that glycerol backbone and three of these fatty acid tails. When triglycerides are broken down and pulled across a plasma membrane, they're broken down into monoglycerides and these fatty acid tails. Um, I'll say it this way, and this is another one of my weird analogies, but uh, just to explain why lipids are broken down into monosaccharides and into fatty acids is because that's as far as you need to break them down to get them across the plasma membrane. Cells don't want to waste energy. So all we're really trying to do in, in absorption of a triglyceride is to get this triglyceride to, to cross this plasma membrane right here. So on the outside, what we have are these big droplets of tri, there's that big triglyceride. And in order to get this big triglyceride to cross this plasma membrane, it's broken down into this monoglyceride and these fatty acid tails. But look what happens. As soon as these fatty acid tails cross that plasma membrane and this monoglyceride crosses that plasma membrane, they're put back together to form that triglyceride once again. And, and it stays this triglyceride form all the way until it gets picked up by this lymphatic vessel. Notice how the triglycerides are too big to fit into normal blood capillaries. They have to travel through those lymphatic lacteals. But, but that means, so inside the cell and inside the lacteal, they're in this triglyceride form. They only need to be broken down to smaller than that triglyceride form when they're crossing that small intestine wall, when they're being absorbed for the first time. So here's where the cell doesn't want to waste time. And here's my weird analogy. I used to, um, this was years ago, I've had a bunch of random side jobs. And one of my random side jobs that I used to do for money is work on the weekends to put in those energy efficient windows that Home Depot sells. So you may be aware that they sell these double paned windows that are filled with a layer of gas that's supposed to give like extra insulation and, and they're energy efficient windows. They make you not have to use as much energy to heat or cool your house. But anyway, the problem is like for me, I'm working on the weekends. I don't want to spend a lot of time. And when we get into these houses to put these windows in, it was assumed in the paperwork that the people would have the room clear of all of the furniture and stuff before we have to go. Because sometimes like we just go in and we score the glass and we would just break the glass and then pick up all the pieces with like a vacuum and all of this stuff. And sometimes if it's windy um, outside, things get blown around. And so whenever we go into a new room, it's, the people are supposed to have all this furniture moved out of the way. We went into this, there was this really sweet old lady that we went uh, to install windows and there was a room, it was this dining room where there was this really big, pretty dining room table. It had four really big legs and it was right in front of the window and it wasn't moved at all. So the first thing that, that me and one of my buddies had to do was to get this table out into the hallway so that it didn't get damaged. 
and she couldn't move it by herself. So um, I remember one of the things she said, she said she wants this table in another room. She didn't even want it here, but she didn't know how to move it and get it through the door because the table with these legs on it, you know, it's just too big to fit through the door. So in my, I wanted to save time and I wanted to get the, this big table out, out of the door. So here's what I did. I don't know if I can draw this, but you've got a table that's got these four legs on it. And, and, and obviously the, the table is too wide, I guess, to fit through the door. So what I did, uh, each of the, the legs had like four screws on the bottom. And I, I could have taken off all four of those legs and then taken all four of those legs and set them out in the hallway. And then I would just have had the tabletop that I could have taken out into the hallway. But remember, she wanted this put into another room. I would have had to stick all four legs back on if I would have taken all four legs off. So here's what I did to save time. I did just like lipid digestion does. I took off only two of the legs of the table. Now I've got this L shape. And so I tilted kind of the legs were still sticking out and we, we put the, the table kind of sideways this way. And then we, I don't know if I'm doing this right with my hands, but you can kind of picture if we, if we had like this L shape, we could stick the legs out and then pull the table out this way. So I only had to take off two legs. And once we got to the other side of the hallway, I just had to put on the two legs. And now we had the table put back together. It saved me half the time. And the rest of the day, I was telling everybody that I work with, this is just how lipids are digested and they didn't care. But um, anyway, I didn't think of anything new. This is how the cells get these large triglycerides to be absorbed in the first place. So monosaccharides can wiggle through this space. Fatty acids can wiggle through that space. And then what's on the other side, they're put back together to these triglycerides. That's how it's stored. That's our long-term energy molecule. So um, if we go back further up here, and I think I have another picture that's a little, this is the same picture. We're just looking at this part, but just zoomed in. I wanted to show the difference between these lipases that actually separate triglycerides into fatty acids and monosaccharides from those bile salts. Because we have up here, there's bile and there's lipases involved in lipid digestion. So here at the very top, let's, let's look at this. This is a droplet of triglycerides that we might have just eaten. And the, you know, there's a bunch of triglycerides in this droplet. So what the bile salts do is that they take this large fat droplet and they separate it into a bunch of smaller fat droplets. This, this breaking apart of fats is what we call emulsification. So the, the bile salts, you can think of those as emulsifiers. Um, like Dawn detergent or, or dish soap, that's an emulsifier. If you do dishes, you know that water and lipids don't want to mix. But if you put a little bit of that Dawn dish soap in there, that forces the water and the lipids to mix. That's an emulsifier. So bile salts are one of these emulsifiers that is going to force those lipids to mix with these digestive enzymes. Um, you know, by themselves, they wouldn't want to mix together, but these bile salts, they are an emulsifier that help these lipids mix with the lipases. Now we get that chemical digestion of triglycerides getting broken into their monosaccharides and fatty acid pieces. Each are small enough to fit through the plasma membrane. So they're are those monosaccharides and those fatty acids moving through the plasma membrane and getting reassembled once inside the cell. But when these things leave the cell, they're going into one of those lacteals rather than a normal blood capillary. Okay, so we've said that. Um, you can see these are the last two slides, but it's just a chart that reminds us of the enzyme and the biomolecule that that enzyme breaks down. So we have this on our chart. Carbohydrates are broken down by amylase. Proteins are broken down by pepsin. Fats are broken down by lipases. And remember, bile salts aid in the digestion just by being an emulsifier. Nucleic acids are chemically broken down by those nucleases, but these are not mentioned a lot because those are mostly information storage molecules, not really broken down as an energy source. So we made it all the way through that. I know that's a lot of digestive slides. I'm sure I'm past my normal lecture time. So if you need a couple of minutes to stretch your legs, feel free to do that. 
I will gather these lab, mo uh, sorry, I'm gonna gather di the digestive models and my lab list, and I guess just stay somewhere over here and we can gather around and check those things off the lab list. If I went too fast on any of the, the lecture stuff, let me know, I'll be glad to repeat those things. You're also welcome to check out my notes over here, even though they've got a bunch of scribble on it. I can decipher that if needed.